So it's my pleasure to say welcome to Trudy, who's going to be talking about the Hook Mountain Hawk Watch tonight, so that you can know how important these hawk watches are, how to connect with this local hawk watch, and maybe how you can help as well. So Trudy, if you want to start your screen share. Okay. Uh, first, I'm the coordinator for Hook Mountain Hawk Watch uh, over in Rockland County. And I have Drew Panko, who is the coordinator of Fire Island Hawk Watch here. So we have a little bit of experience with hawk watching. I'm also the editor of the Northeast Hawk Watch uh, annual report. And I've just finished the report for last year. And that should be at the publishers this week if anybody's waiting for their issue. Uh, and um, so we've been in hawk watching for a while. And uh, I've been wa watching hawks on Hook Mountain since uh, the 70s. Uh, and Drew introduced me actually to, to Hook Mountain. Uh, Drew, you want to say anything about yourself? I'm uh, just a long time uh, Hook Mountain uh, devotee. Uh, <laughs> It's probably last year was probably my 50th year up there. And at least it may have been one or two years more than that. Uh, if it wasn't last year, it'll be this year. I hope to see you all up there this yes, year. Yes, right. <laughs> we need everybody to come this year. So uh, I'm also a math teacher. So that uh, does enter into the uh, into uh, the work with the Northeast Hawk Watch Report. So, uh, and of course, the reason why I love the numbers. But uh, in reality, uh, what is the Hook Mountain Hawk Watch? Well, what is it? It really, people might say, well, it's the place. It's that place on the Hudson River over there. And my answer is no, no. Hook Mountain Hawk Watch is the people. The people who participate, who collectively assemble together to uh, collect data on hawks and count those hawks and uh, help us to know a little bit about what's going on with their populations and uh, understand uh, their trends and, uh, and help uh, in the conservation effort for raptors. So that's what a hawk watch is, it's people. And here we have Vince Bloger and Drew last year on uh, November 4th. Uh, which happened to have been a super wonderful day last year. We'll get to that near the end. Uh, but uh, Vince may have, we, we met Vince in, in uh, the late spring up on Bear Mountain uh, this spring. And uh, he told us he may be leaving the country and moving elsewhere. So we may be missing Vince. And we have a whole bunch of people here from a few years ago. Danielle is the one who counted our really big um, over 14,000 Broadwing day back in, I think it was 2011. And um, she's moved, she's moved to Pennsylvania. And now we have one that's staunch supporter every year. This is John Phillips. Uh, he's, uh, he's there every Tuesday. Uh, and except for the first Tuesday this, this year, uh, he couldn't make it. And Anne is going to fill in for him on that day. So he's, he's there every Tuesday uh, counting hawks for us, uh, rain or shine. And he does even go up in the rain. We usually have a luncheon when we don't have COVID. We have a luncheon at the end of the season in December. And uh, you can see that I noticed that Avril was here in the audience tonight <laughs> uh, in the middle of the picture here, but we have some pe people that maybe some of you recognize, all right? And uh, so these people are looking at the screen at the moment. You can, you can see Dave's eyes focused up. And just another view of people on the mountain. Uh, these uh, We get crowds of this nature uh, in September, mostly. Uh, and of course, since COVID, we get a lot of uh, people who are not watching hawks as well. So we have lots and lots of counters uh, that um, we, we kept tabs on. And, and these are the people who have counted for, uh, for us at Hook Mountain since I started managing and coordinating the mountain, which was in 2003. Now, many of these people are no longer counting at Hook Mountain because they've moved away or uh, because uh, they've had other challenges, uh, physical challenges like knee problems that prevented them from climbing the mountain or what have you. So, But they're still on the list because they all counted hawks and gave us numbers for their day on Hook. And that's the key important thing about a hawk watch. You have to have the people who commit to be there and you have to have the numbers of hawks that they counted that day, how long they were there, et cetera. All right. So it's very important. These people are very important. And even those who can't count on hook anymore 
because they don't live in the region or for any other reason, their data is still live. The day that they counted their data and gave me, what, 10 Sharpies, uh, 300 Broadwings, uh, whatever it was, two bald eagles, which was a huge amount back you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Those people, the data that they submitted, that data is still alive. And of course, they are as well, but they don't. So even from the people who aren't going up and counting every year anymore. So their data is alive. But we're going to take a look at some of that. Well, we're looking at some uh, red tails up at the uh, book. The, uh, the local red tails are usually a treat. Uh, if the day is slow and we're not getting very migrants, we'll often have uh, a pair of fledgling red tails. This is their territory, and they're out there having fun. It's, uh, it's a great uh, time. I usually try to guess the sex of the session. Uh, there's usually two, and it's most fun when at least one of them is a male. Uh, the, um, the females are a little more sedate and uh, a little mature in their attitudes. <laughs> but the immature males are just crazy about attacking anything else in the air or on the ground. Okay, here's a map uh, from Google Earth. And it is composed of all of the 45 watch sites that counted hawks in fall of 2021 throughout the Northeast. These are the hawk watch sites that are whose data is included in the Northeast Hawk Watch report. And you can see, well, the lines, the horizontal lines, was a suggestion of Ernie, who's here in the audience tonight, and which was a great suggestion because we talk about these sites in the report by region, and the regions are based on the latitudes. Uh, Hook Mountain is right here. And we're going to move into Hook Mountain. And you can see it's right on, on the Hudson River that it's not far from the Tappan Zee Bridge, which has a different name now, but I still call it the Tappan Zee Bridge. And um, that uh, is really not too far from Ches Chestnut Ridge, from Quaker Ridge, uh, from Bear Mountain up here, uh, from, uh, this is Mount Peter, uh, a relatively new site, Purple Chickadee. And of course, our closest actually is State Line, and Lenoir. So uh, this is where we're located among all of our closest neighborhood watch sites. Um, but what if you would travel to Hook and you came from the east side of the river, you go over the Tappan Zee and you wouldn't get off at the first exit, which is right here, but you would get off at the second exit, which is right over here. And when you get off, all right, you have a stop sign here at this little street and you're going to continue and make a left turn, go up Route 9W. And so I'm going to zoom out a little bit, pass the hospital down here. This is the cemetery. We're going to pass the high school and continue on up the road to get to Hook. Well, Hook is over here. So how do you get there? All right. It's in the middle of the mountain. Well, you're going to have to walk one way or another. You have to walk to get there. And that's one of the reasons why some of our former hawk watches don't get there, because it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, as you drive up this road, there is a place that many of us park at alongside the road. And you can tell where it is because the telephone lines cross the road right here. And right in this region where the telephone lines go from the east side to the west side of the road, there's a trailhead, all right, a well-marked trailhead, and the trail uh, goes over through this direction, of course, up to, uh, up to Oak Mountain. The trailhead is marked by uh, three blazes on a tree, three yellow blazes. All right, now, for those of you who use Google Earth, you know that when you move your mouse around, uh, this thing changes at the bottom. You have latitude and longitude, and you also have elevation. So uh, Hook Mountain, you can see the elevation is at 723, 24, 25 feet at Hook Mountain. The car where we park is at 394 feet. So we're talking about close to 400, up above 700. So it's a climb of 325 feet. 
All right. And it's not an easy climb, but it's not a very long one. It's only about a quarter of a mile. So uh, it's relatively easy to get to if you're a hiker. All right. Uh, there is another way if you don't like parking alongside the road or you would rather have a, an easier hike. All right. You can keep going north on the road and turn in to the entrance. This is uh, um, Rockland Lake State Park right here which is a pretty big size state park. And you can go into the south entrance, follow the road down and around the bend. And over here is a road where you can make a right turn and it takes you into the golf course. And the golf course has a large parking area. They ask hawk watchers and hikers to park in the distal part of the lot, which most people are very happy to do. Um, and then you're gonna walk over, this is a flagpole area, Opposite the flagpole is a trail that goes up the mountain. Uh, it's a longer trail. Now notice that this parking lot is at 295 feet in elevation. So you have another 100 feet to climb if you take this pathway. However, uh, it's, still, it's, it's still easier. It's an easier one. There, there aren't as many steep uh, spots along that pathway. So you're going to take that pathway up uh, to um, the long path, actually. Uh, it will tee into the long path that travels along here and goes up to Hook Mountain. So you're going to make a right turn and go on up to Hook. Now, if you make a left turn and go up just a little ways up the hill, you can stand there and look out over the Hudson uh, and get a spectacular view of the Hudson. Uh, and of course, we have spectacular views at Hook as well, but you're so close there that that's, it seems to be worth the effort to me. But okay, so we're talking here. Notice that at the top of that cliff, it's only 555 feet. So that's not as high as uh, Hook Mountain is. All right, now from Hook, our line of sight, what, what can we see? What do we see? We see Rockland Lake. Uh, we can see, obviously, the bridge. Uh, we can see parts of Croton Point. We can't see the whole thing um, because of the mountains, the hills in here, right along this edge. But we can see the upper edge of uh, Croton Point. We can see uh, we can see Bear Mountain, actually, uh, which is way up in here. Uh, we can see Perkins Tower, which is right in here. All right. Uh, and we can actually see that tower um, from Hook Mountain. It's not easy to see, you need, <laughs> but you can see it easily with, with binoculars, all right? So uh, we also can see, we can't, we can't see state line and we can't see any of the other watches. I think we might be able to see Lenoir if we look carefully with the scope, all right? Uh, but you can't see state line because of the hill down here. Now, we do get to see the New York City skyline uh, over these ridges in here, all right? So... Um, so that's um, um, that's situating you. And what I would recommend is that if you enter Rockland Lake Executive Golf Course uh, on your maps program, that uh, that will get you to um, get you to that parking lot. Way up there on the top is Bear Mountain. And we've got Rockland Lake. Hudson River, Croton Point, Hemlock, Mills Hill, and across the river, and Tarrytown. So I hope you're not getting dizzy. And the bridge. <laughs> and Piermont. And then behind us, high school. Oh, and there's Drew. And then the trail going out. Okay, now that area that Drew was coming up out of is an area that at that time of the year, you notice that there weren't any leaves on the trees, it was late. Uh, that time of the year, we checked that short grass because we have had, uh, on October 15th of 2012, we had a short-eared owl pop out of there and fly up out over uh, what 
looks like it's over the high school there. And that's when I quick grabbed my camera. I wasn't expecting it and took a picture of along uh, the short. It's not a particularly good picture, but nevertheless, an exciting experience. We've only had four documented there, but I suspect there are lots more. People just don't see them. Very good. When you're up on the uh, hook and you're looking around, you see some beautiful scenery. But you should be aware you're you're standing on what a great deal of history. Right? The rocks that are up there are very, very old and have seen a lot of changing times. In fact, they're about 220 million years old. Okay, They erupted as lava and uh, spent most of their time uh, under some 600 feet of sedimentary rocks which over the 220 million years eroded away. This, this is long before there was any stream such as the Hudson River in the vicinity. <laughs> All right. uh, the, um, in fact, there wasn't even an Atlantic Ocean when there was the rocks from Hook Mountain. Uh, the, the rocks from Hook Mountain were formed in the same geology that opened up a wide gap in Pangaea, and that wide gap uh, we now call the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but uh, back 220 million years ago, you could have walked from Hook Mountain right on to the sea, Saharan Desert, uh, or at least the land that is now the Saharan Desert. Lord knows what it was like back then. Okay, so here we have... Um, a, uh, this is not Photoshop. This is a real picture. <laughs> um, this is a red-shouldered hawk that uh, was flying uh, on the west side, had passed over us already, and uh, it was just in view. And we had had the moon out that day. It was out in the sky. So I waited until it got to that certain point, and I took a picture. So uh, we get, uh, in contrast to uh, the the bird that we saw earlier, that had windows to the trailing edge, that was the red-tailed hawk. This is a red-shouldered hawk with windows that are crescent-shaped. Uh, but I just love the idea. And we get one of the things that's so fantastic about Hook is that we get very close, well, and relative to other watch sites, we're very close to the birds. Um, not all birds, many of them are at a distance, but we get many birds that fly right over our heads, all right? And um, what I wanted to do at this point is to show you the web page um, that's uh, badly.com slash hook. And on the web page, we have a number of things, including uh, a link into the weather. So that you can go to the web page and find out what tomorrow's weather is forecast to be. Tomorrow looks like pretty decent. Well, that's west northwest winds, right? Um, and actually, this morning it was northwest, so it's actually gone west on us. And it gives you the temperatures that are expected and uh, the wind gusts, etc. So that's one op option, one aspect. And then you get to see some of the things that we've seen before, some of the data that we have. There's a whole lot of stuff here uh, on the web page, including directions up here. Um, there's links to our data. <coughs> Excuse me. This is uh, our historical data, our historical yearly data for the birds. Um, and we have uh, a schedule posted here. And right now you can see on the schedule that we have Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays scheduled. We need help, all right? Uh, we don't have coverage at this point for many days coming up this season, and we're getting kind of close. So uh, we need help. If any of you can help us with even one or two days, it would be very, very much appreciated um, because it's we're an all-volunteer group. This is an all-volunteer. We don't pay anybody to do it. It's an assemblage of people who are just concerned about hawks and love the site. All right. Hook, uh, Hook Mountain is just a wonderful site. Um, and if you do choose to go up and uh, you can check out um, what the data sheet looks like. And that's all here online. And this is a data sheet that we fill out hourly for a little bit of weather. It doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, 
and then hawks. And you see that we have a whole bunch of unidentified hawks. You don't have to know what every hawk species is. If you don't know it, but you know it's a hawk, you can identify it as a, an unidentified raptor, right? So that's our data sheet. And um, okay. And then of course we have the, the data for this current year. And so far we only have one day of coverage, all right? And Raymond, that was Raymond who did that day. So, and he only was up there for an hour. So we need help. We need more people to get up there this year. Oh, uh, uh, wrong site. Okay. Let me just arrow down and get down to, to this video and check out the, um, the windows to the trailing edge. I got to get this set. There we go. Watch this bird. As, which of course is a red tail. And of course you probably saw it on the other one, the other video as well, but watch the windows to the trailing edge on this bird. You see the windows coming through. It's an immature red tail hawk. You got those windows that look like a rectangular part on it, as opposed to, and you could always go back to the website to finish seeing the rest of that video. <coughs> he lands in a tree incidentally. And that's the kind of things that we get on hook. We have these birds coming in quite close as opposed to this bird, which is the red shouldered hawk that has the window that's a crescent shape. And um, this bird left, all right, <laughs> flying in migration, flew over our heads, got counted and is headed uh, towards its migration. Uh, territory. He's going down for winter territory. So this is what September of last year was like on Hook. All right. These are the days. These are the initials for the people who covered. Uh, this is our day, one of our days, TB and DP. That's us. All right. And you can see that we have lots of other initials on here. Um, and, uh, and so, but what we can see also is that the maximum, because I've highlighted this, the maximum day or the maximum amount of broad wings that we had was 335 broad wings in a single day. That, that, year. that was last, last fall. That was our maximum. That was unheard of how low that number was. All right. Uh, I have never seen a number that low for a maximum day for broad wings. So the seasons are very different from now and from 20 or 30 years ago and even from last, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago. So this is another year. This is from 2011. And here we had Danielle Gustafson and Drew and I were there. We were actually there ahead of Danielle that day. And at 7.30, the Broadwings started very, very early for Broadwings, but it was a warm, sunny day and they just lifted up. So uh, what I want to do is show you the differences between what can happen in one year versus what can happen in another. As Trudy mentioned, uh, the hawks are low at uh, Hook Mountain. And the reason is uh, that they've been crossing the Hudson River and don't get any lift. And broad wings like to glide and pick up some lift. And when they find the lift, they will kettle and circle up. And where they find the lift is uh, at Hook Mountain. The reason is the if it's a north wind, it'll be coming down at Hitch North it hits the north side of uh, Hook Mountain and creates a rising kettle of air and the hawks kettle in it. Or if it's southerly wind, it hits the southern side of Hook Mountain and again creates the orographic lift that they need and uh, they'll take off. But you'll very often on Hook, when you have a good number of broad wings, they'll be kettling right at a low altitude nearby and easy to see. We have a an adult uh, broad wing over here on the left and on the right is a graph of the season of the occurrence of the broad wings. And you can see it's a very narrow band. It occurs around mid-September, somewhere between the 10th and the 20th. And uh, with the most common uh, date there, that's halfway between uh, half the number of broad wings have passed by September 17th. And... Uh, 
that's a very narrow thing. Very narrow distribution. All right. So the broad wings that were counted last year, uh, that very low high number for us, uh, shows you the number of broad wings we had last year. This is our graph uh, for broad wings. We're very, very low at Hook Mountain. And, uh, and that data is here in that point. The data for the 2011, 14,000 is right here on that point. The data, Danielle doesn't live here anymore. She hasn't counted for us for a while. Uh, she used to count every Saturday <laughs> and she hasn't counted for us for a while, but her data is still here. She is very much alive at Hook Mountain because that data contributes to our trends and will forever. She, she, she really can't leave us because we, we're holding a part of her. <laughs> and uh, now if we then take last year's data and look at the last year's data for the whole Northeast, it also was a relatively low year for Broadwinds. And uh, this comes from the Northeast Hawk Watch uh, report. And this is my, uh, uh, it, this is my draft version of the report. So, uh, and the centerfold here, uh, what we have in the middle of the centerfold for the Northeast Hawk Watch report gives a 40 year trend, whoops, wrong, too far back, 40 year trend for, um, uh, for 16 different species of hawks all over the North, the Northeast. All right. And uh, so the broad wings, and that's where this map, is, this graph is from, okay? But uh, what was also interesting is that um, we had, I had a dilemma in this particular issue uh, that we last year discovered that the broad wings um, were declining in our migration counts, but at the same time, they're increasing in the breeding bird counts. And so uh, I investigated that a little bit further this year. I'm, I'm trying to find out where it is because I don't, here we go. No, that's still, that's uh, Sharpies. Okay. Uh, and here we go. Uh, so the breeding bird survey birds um, were most frequent in 1990 in Connecticut, less so in the other states in, in the Northeast. But uh, in more recent years, they're more frequent in New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts a little bit more in Vermont, but actually slightly less uh, in, in Connecticut. So uh, how does that, how can there be more birds that are breeding in the Northeast? And how can we possibly be getting fewer birds uh, in our migration? So that's one of the things that I investigated in this report. And I looked at the, um, the forest habitats and how the forest habitats have changed because I found an article about that. And I believe, and I'm, it's not the final word because I didn't do the study, but I believe that the change in forest habitats has pushed our birds further north, probably combined together with the maturing of the woodlands after the farms were st you know, stopped growing uh, that in the, the north where they weren't developed. This is the amount of development. Um, that move the birds further north and they're probably leaving the region further north than they used to. And, um, and there's also some maps in here from the, uh, the birds, the five birds that were successfully uh, uh, fitted with telemetry data and, uh, and successfully uh, overwintered uh, south of us in Northern South, South America and uh and also but so so we do quite a bit and whoops my battery's going down no we don't want that to happen let me plug in sorry about that yeah there we go i think that's okay now yep okay so uh so that's an interesting thing that w the data that you collect you may be sitting on top of the mountain and even if you're sitting there with hardly any birds that day that is a very important information for us because it helps us to think about and, and, and ask the, some of the questions that may be the right questions to ask about these species. And um, so. All right. Um, each month has its own features. As we mentioned before, we get this narrow window centered on uh, September 17th for the uh, broad-winged hawks. The picture there is an adult uh, broad wing. Sorry about that. But uh, the width of the season is very, very narrow. But even though the width of the season is very narrow, there is a difference between the early season 
of broad wings and the late season broad wings. They are different ages. The, the young lead the adults. Uh, and you get many more young early in a season. And I always look forward to my first re- adult. Sometimes I've seen hundreds of immatures before I see my first adult. In the osprey, we see a much wider band of occurrence. All right. Now, the scale is very different here. This is 14 and this is 1,000. <laughs> so the um, you see fewer osprey on any one day, but you see the osprey spread over a much wider uh, uh, region of time. The first ospreys are adults, all right? And the books say, and the banders say, that the first ospreys to migrate are the adult females, and they do so in August. So that's even before we start counting. Then we get the adult males, and finally, we get the adult, we get the immatures. Uh, the kestrels, all right, are also very interesting. We're hitting a peak halfway point at September 22nd. And there was a paper published uh, some 10 years ago from Hawk Mountain and says it's a bimodal distribution. Well, it doesn't look bimodal to me. <laughs> There's only one major peak around late September with an occasional big day later on. And uh, the speculation uh, in the article was that it was males and females separated. But we don't see it up here. We don't see it down on Fire Island. Now, Northern Harrier is different. Uh, Northern Harrier is even a wider distribution of dates. Uh, we don't get halfway through our Harrier migration until October 6th. And all of those before October 6th, almost all of them are immatures. Again, the, the young will show the adults the way. <laughs> and the, the next one is we start getting adult females. And that's an immature. The, the adult females will have uh, streaks underneath. Uh, the final uh, late October, early November harriers are going to be males. And this particular individual came up over the over those trees. It was so close to us. I felt like I could almost touch this bird. So, okay, October, not a whole lot to say, except that we have uh, the peak day for Sharpies very early in October and the peak day for uh, Coops, actually. Uh, 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 within a week, a uh, week of that. Uh, we have peak days for a bunch of other things here. We have some vulture activity. We've got shoulders that are moving along here. Uh, our peak day for the red tails is only 13, very, very much lower than it used to be because we don't get as many migrating anymore um, and so on. So uh, uh, this is October and this is kind of what October looks like. And and so we have Sharpies um, uh, being through, half of them are through by October 2nd. For Coops, half of them are through by October 8th. And quite different. Those two are very different from the shoulders and the red tails. The shoulders and red tails don't start until middle, the mid-October, and they move on through November. Now, we haven't always had coverage until late. Uh, we, only, we only cover until Thanksgiving. So uh, it's it's really not that much. With there may very well be more birds um, that we might have been able to get if we covered some more later in the season. The red-tailed migration actually continues well into December. And I just couldn't resist putting this in because those uh, those uh, windows show even when it looks dark when these birds are shaded out. But of in October, uh, we have to say something about these Cooper's Hawks, because we had a record count of Cooper's Hawks at Hook Mountain last year. Uh, we had 350 Cooper's Hawks. Uh, this dot right here on the map, that's 50 more than our other highest numbers of Cooper's Hawks. It was just like wild, way off the scale for us. So it was very exciting and good, even though in the last 10 years or so, they're really 
hadn't been what we might have expected in here. Um, with these higher numbers here, you'd expect a few others, and we finally got one. So that was last year. Comparing that with the Northeast Hawkwatch, uh, they also had a little bit better year than the previous two, but not as good as 2018. So uh, it doesn't quite jive with that um, because this is just one site. The Northeast Hawk Watch represents all sites all the way up to New Brunswick and including the Fire Island sites, uh, uh, you know, along the seashore. So this is a uh, representative of the whole, uh, the whole Northeast. So that's our Cooper's Hawks. And now we're into November. Uh, and November, I did want to mention, because I hadn't so far, we counted over a thousand monarchs on Hook Mountain. Uh, we're counting monarchs now. <laughs> and uh, we, did, we did pretty well last year. Now, compared to Fire Island, I don't think Fire Island had 5,000 or something. But nevertheless, <laughs> we had 1,000 monarchs, and I'm happy, very happy about that. But super duper, our best day, best of all for me, Drew and I, on the, uh, on the 4th of, of November, uh, had seven golden eagles, an unheard of seven golden eagles in one day. And uh, we had three of those seven in one binocular view with a bald eagle. So uh, this particular bird, those three with the bald eagle didn't fly right over hook. They flew where we could see them easily, et cetera, but they didn't fly right over us. This was a bird that flew right over us on the 18th. Two weeks later, we had two more golden eagles. So as far as I'm concerned, 2021 was the golden eagle year uh, for Hook Mountain. And uh, uh, once in a lifetime for me to see that many at once. Now, of course, especially at Hook Mountain, uh, uh, there are some other sites west of us uh, that see more. Do you know? Okay, I just wanted to check to see if Drew had any comments. He was there. It was Drew and Vince, those two in the beginning, on that day with the seven golden eagles. All right, just we're still, still on uh, November 4th. Uh, the, uh, I saw three dark uh, birds soaring over uh, north of the, the watch, and I said, gee, they don't look like they have any dihedral. They're probably black vultures. And I lift my my binoculars, and oh, they're not black vultures. What are they? They look like golden eagles, but they're not black. Could they be black? No, they look like golden eagles. And these three birds in soaring in one field of view, they couldn't have been further. Yeah, one than came out from behind the mountain, and then another one, and then we had seen one go go beyond the mountain. We saw that first and then it came out and then another one came out and then another one came out and they kind of circled up in the middle and we'd be looking over um, over uh, the Rockland Lake in that direction. And and then a ball flew then in. Then a ball them. flew in to join them. <laughs> and they were no further apart than 10 or 20 feet. <laughs> so, it was unbelievable. So the point is that Golden Eagles, for me, Golden Eagles, uh, uh, the... Uh, Halloween is a golden eagle day because I had a golden eagle on the top of uh, um, Sunrise Mountain once uh, on uh, on Halloween when my kids were little and I was looking down at it. So that to me, Halloween is a golden eagle day. And as it works, as it works out here on Hook Mountain, we also have an, a median date for golden eagles uh, of October 31st. So half of them come before and half of them after. But look at how much fewer, what a, what a shorter uh, flight period it has relative to the bald eagle that starts in August and goes all through. It actually uh, is half of them are through by September 30th. And uh, and then we have all, uh, whoop, I didn't intend to do that, but Hope does want you. <laughs> so we need your help this year. We want you to come and help us. And uh, count those bald eagles. Count, right. So well, join us on Hook and uh, what uh, what we would like you to do is contact us, check out that schedule, contact us, tell us that you're, you're happy to come, uh, or come and visit with us on a Thursday. We're up there every Thursday, and um, we'll, uh, we'll enjoy having you there with us. We always love having company. Now, so I'm going to challenge you. Um, this is a red-tailed hawk. 
that does something Take an a little elevator unusual. Down. Woo! He just <laughs> only did a spinover. And I repeated it in slow motion, so you're going to get to see it again. So my challenge to you is if you take a day up on Hook Mountain and you see a red tail do that, <laughs> if you see a red tail do that, then I will buy you a membership in the Northeast Hawk Watch uh, uh, organization so you can get to read <laughs> about all of these things, okay? And I don't care how many of you do it. If you can see that, you go up there and you, I will buy your membership. So uh, this is, uh, do we have any questions?